four brawny men who look like Judeans and Judeans more worthy of the cross than the condemned men, certainly of the same category as the scourges, jump from a path onto the place of the execution. They are wearing short sleeveless tunics and in their hands they are holding nails, hammers and ropes which they show to the condemned men, scoffing at them. The crowd is excited with cruel frenzy. The centurion offers Jesus the amphora so that he may drink the anaesthetic mixture of wine and myrrh. But Jesus refuses it. The two robbers, however, drink a lot of it. Then the amphora, with a wide flared mouth, is placed near a large stone, almost on the edge of the summit. Just to interrupt the narrative there, um, this amphora, um, for Jesus' benefit, was given um, by Joanna of Chusa. Joanna of Chusa, she's mentioned in the Gospels. She's the wife of Chusa, who is Herod's chief steward, a very important figure politically. And that does account for his wavering in relation to Jesus throughout the gospel, or as I should say, throughout the gospel as revealed to me, that is to Maria Valtorta. Chusa is a very, very interesting figure. Um, not as much backbone as we'd like, but though I don't know, I think in the end he becomes a stalwart of the faith. Um, Joanna is always a stalwart of the faith. She'd been sick and that's how we encounter her first when Jesus cures her. We don't hear about her in this part which I'm reading, but I just wanted to say where this amphora comes from, this, this um, vessel which contains this mixture. And what is most important theologically, and of course testifying to Jesus' heroism, is that he does not take this, he does not do anything that will diminish his suffering. He is the Lamb of God who is to take away the sins of the world. And the lambs that are slaughtered in the temple are not given any anaesthetic, nor is the Lamb of God given any anaesthetic. He will suffer completely and suffer for us that complete pain that is going to befall him. To continue the narrative, the condemned men are ordered to undress. The two robbers do so without shame. On the contrary, they amuse themselves making obscene gestures towards the crowd and in particular towards a group of priests who are all white in their linen garments and who have gone back to the lower open space little by little, taking advantage of their caste to creep up there. This, by the way, they'd been run out of, of the space they were on by Roman soldiers who were just fed up. Um, and Longinus, um, the centurion, was fed up with their jeering and their um, causing a tumult. So they were driven away, but now they're beginning to come back. The priests have been joined by two or three Pharisees and other overbearing personages whom hatred has made friends. There's an historic, I'm just inter interjecting again, um, it is known that the priesthood and the Pharisee caste were not friends. In the periods leading up to um, Jesus' time, the priesthood was gradually weakened by the growing power of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were very ruthless and they would often threaten people with death if they crossed them too much. And so at the time of Jesus, the Pharisees are really stronger politically than the priesthood is. That's just a bit of background. So to continue. The executioners offer the condemned men three rags so that they may tie them round their groins. The robbers take them, uttering the most horrible curses. Jesus, who strips himself slowly because of the pangs of the wounds, refuses it. He perhaps thinks that he can keep on the short drawers, which he had also on during the flagellation. 
But when he's told to take them off as well, he stretches out his hand to beg for the rag of the executioners to conceal his nakedness. He is really the annihilated one to the extent of having to ask for a rag from criminals. But Mary has noticed everything. And by the way, as St. John tells us in the gospel, and as we know from the Stations of the Cross, Mary is now at the foot of the cross. She's on that hill of Calvary, on Golgotha. Um, she'd been brought there actually by St. John. And um, it was a, a way of the cross for her as well. So to go back to the narrative, but Mary has noticed everything and she has removed the long, thin, white veil covering her head under her dark mantle and on which she has already shed so many tears. She removes it without letting her mantle drop and gives it to John so that he may hand it to Longinus for her son. The centurion takes the veil without any objection. And when he sees that Jesus is about to strip himself completely, facing the side where there are no people and thus turning towards the crowd, his back furrowed with bruises and blisters and covered with sores and dark crusts that are bleeding again, Longinus gives him his mother's linen veil. Jesus recognises it and wraps it round his pelvis several times, fastening it carefully so that it may not fall off. And on the linen veil, so far soaked only with tears, the first drops of blood begin to fall because many of the wounds, just covered with blood clots, have reopened again as he stooped to take off his sandals and lay down his garments and blood is streaming down again. Jesus now turns towards the crowd and one can thus see that his chest, legs and arms as well have all been struck by the scourges. At the height of his liver there is a huge bruise and under his left costal arch there are seven clear stripes in relief ending with seven small cuts bleeding inside a violaceous circle. A cruel blow of a scourge in such a sensitive region of the diaphragm. His knees bruised by repeated falls that began immediately after he was captured and ended on Calvary, are dark with hematomas and the kneecaps are torn, particularly the right one, by a large bleeding wound. Just to pause the narrative there, um, there's a, a small point, there are numerous points that um, we can draw from the Shroud of Turin. One that is very interesting, um, as we know, Jesus falls several times. The Shroud image at the knee, at the knees, contains particles of earth. But what is extremely interesting is that identified in those particles, in that dust of the earth, are particles of a particular kind of stone which is found almost exclusively around the Damascus Gate area of Jerusalem. So if we were to say the Shroud of Turin was forged, we're looking at a forger who's actually putting dust from the very place where our Lord Jesus is said to have been on the Shroud and in a way that would not enable medieval forgers to find it, but with such foresight, this forger, this hypothetical forger, foresees that men in the 20th and 21st centuries will be able to spot that that earth that he has put there so cleverly is actually from that region, just outside of the Jerusalem. We 
resuming the narrative. The robbers are tied to the crosses and carried to their places, one to the right, one to the left of the place destined for Jesus. They howl, swear and curse, particularly when the crosses are carried to the holes and hurt them, making the ropes cut into their wrists. Their oaths against God, the law, the Romans and the Judeans are hellish. It is Jesus' turn. He lies on the cross meekly. The two robbers were so rebellious that as the four executioners were not sufficient to hold them, some soldiers had to intervene to prevent them from kicking away the torturers who were tying their wrists to the cross. But no help is required for Jesus. He lies down and places his head where they tell him. He stretches out his arms and his legs as he is told. He only takes care to arrange his veil properly. Now his long, slender, white body stands out against the dark wood and the yellow ground. Two executioners sit on his chest to hold him fast. And I think of the oppression and pain he must have felt under that weight. A third one takes his right arm, holding him with one hand on the first part of his forearm and the other on the tips of his fingers. The fourth one, who already has in his hand the long, sharp, pointed quadrangular nail, ending with a round, flat head as big as a large coin of bygone days, watches whether the hole already made in the wood corresponds to the radius ulna joint of the wrist. It does. The executioner places the point of the nail on the wrist. He raises the hammer and gives the first stroke. And just to pause there again, there's this issue about where Jesus was nailed. The, the, the statement that look, you cannot just put the nails in the palms of the hands because the, the, the hands will rip um, away from the cross and the body will fall. That was something I, growing up, um, heard. But this is a vision given before um, those things, before I was born, back in the 40s, 1940s. The executioner, as it said, the executioner places the point of the nail on the wrist. And that is where um, those who look into this say the nail would have had to have gone. So despite our Catholic art, which beautifully displays our Jesus with the wounds right in the centre of the palms of his hands. Maria Valtorta, seeing that artwork all the time that she grew up like we Catholics grew up, she didn't actually have a vision of what she might have seen in the churches she attended or on the, the holy pictures in the walls of her homes. Now she sees the vision as the nail going through the wrist, which suggests to me more authenticity to her visions. This is not someone making up images here. To resume the narrative. Jesus, who had closed his eyes, utters a cry and has a contraction because of the sharp pain and opens his eyes flooded with tears. The pain he suffers must be dreadful. The nail penetrates, tearing muscles, veins, nerves, shattering bones. I must pause again even though it's disrupting the narrative. Because it says here, shattering bones. Now, Maria Valtorta is observing the events. You must remember that. She says shattering bones, but she has no way of knowing if bones are shattered when the nail goes in. 
In fact, the intention is to um, put the nail in a position where it will, where the, the nail will be um, held between the bones and so can be preventing any flesh tearing the, the arm away from the cross. So there's no reason to believe that the bones would have been shattered. One would be looking to put the nail through the bones if one was an experienced crucifier. And I mention this though particularly because prophecy tells us not one bone of his body will be broken. And so we must just put this statement, shattering bones, down to Maria's observation of a nail going into his wrist and assuming that that would have shattered bone. But there's no reason to believe it actually did. Now I'll resume the narrative. Mary replies to the cry of her tortured son with a groan that sounds almost like the moaning of a slaughtered lamb. And she bends as if she were crushed, holding her head in her hands. In order not to torture her, Jesus utters no more cries. But the strokes continue, methodical and hard. Iron striking iron. And we must consider that a living limb receives them. The right hand is now nailed. They pass on to the left one. The hole in the wood does not correspond to the corpus. So they take a rope, tie it to the left wrist and pull it until the joint is dislocated, tearing tendons and muscles, besides lacerating the skin already cut into by the ropes used to capture him. I must stop there. For those who've read the revelations of Anne Catherine Emmerich, and I've said they suffer from the problem that they are not her direct revelation transcribed by her, put down in writing by her. They are given in her Germanic dialect, a particular dialect she has to Clemens Brentano, the famous 19th century romantic poet who had a different dialect of German. And this has caused great inaccuracies in Anne Catherine Emmerich's visions, though they're greatly, very, very worthy because you get men like our great Jesuit of the 19th century, Gerard Manley Hopkins, a friend of John Henry Newman, who converted to the faith from Anglicanism. Gerard Manley Hopkins says when he read the, the Passion of Our Lord in Anne Catherine Emmerich writings, he wept. They are powerful. And here there's a correspondence, if I remember Anne Catherine Emmerich's writing on the Passion correctly, where Jesus' arm is pulled so that the hand will fit the place of the, for the nail, um, which was otherwise not being the right place, and causes Jesus great pain. And in fact, in The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson, we see that happening because Mel Gibson is drawing on and Catherine Emmerich's vision of the Passion for the detail of his film, of his great film. So to continue, after Jesus' wrist has been pulled, dislocating his arm, she says, the other hand must suffer as well because it is stretched as a consequence and the hole in it widens round the nail. Now the beginning of the metacarpus near the wrist hardly reaches the hole. They resign themselves and nail the hand where they can, that is between the thumb and the other fingers, right in the middle of the metacarpus. So we have here a slightly different nailing than from the other hand, and that corresponds more to Catholic art, but it happens purely because of the practicalities of not being able to um, get the, na the nail in the right place in the wrist, as was got with the other hand. 
She continues, the nail penetrates more easily here, but with greater pain because it cuts important nerves so that the fingers remain motionless while those of the right hand have contractions and tremors that denote their vitality. But Jesus no longer utters cries. He only moans in a deep, hoarse voice with his lips firmly closed while tears of pain fall on the ground after falling on the wood. It is now the turn of his feet. Over two meters above the foot of the cross, there is a small wedge, hardly sufficient for one foot. Both feet are placed on it to see whether it is in the right spot. And as it is a little low and the feet hardly reach it, they pull the poor martyr by his malioli. So the coarse wood of the cross rubs on the wounds and moves the crown that tears his hair once again and is on the point of falling. One of the executioners presses it down on his head again with a slap. Those who were sitting on Jesus' chest now get up to move to his knees because Jesus, with an involuntary movement, withdraws his legs upon seeing the very long nail, which is twice as long and thick as those used for the hands shine in the sunshine. They wait on his flayed knees and press on his poor bruised shins, while the other two are performing the much more difficult operation of nailing one foot on top of the other, trying to combine the two joints of the tarsi. Although they try to keep the feet still, holding them by the malleoli and toes on the wedge, the foot underneath is shifted by the vibrations of the nail and they almost have to unnail it because the nail, which has pierced the tender parts and is already blunt, having pierced the right foot, is to be moved a little closer to the centre and they hammer and hammer and hammer. Only the dreadful noise of the hammer striking the head of the nail is heard because all Calvary is nothing but eyes and ears to perceive acts and noises and rejoice. The harsh noise of iron is accompanied by the low plaintive lament of a dove, the hoarse groaning of Mary, who bends more and more at each stroke, as if the hammer wounded her, the martyr mother. And one understands that she is about to be crushed by such torture. Crucifixion is dreadful, equal to flagellation in regard to pain. It is more cruel to be seen because one sees the nails disappear in the flesh. But in compensation, it is shorter, whereas flagellation is enervating because of its duration. And Maria Valtorta comments, I think that the agony of Gethsemane, the flagellation and the crucifixion are the most dreadful moments. They reveal all the torture of the Christ to me. His death relieves me because I say it is all over. But they are not the end. They are the beginning of new sufferings. The cross is now dragged near the hole and it jerks on the uneven ground shaking the poor crucified. The cross is raised and twice it slips out of the hands of those raising it. The first time it falls with a crash. The second time it falls on its right arm, causing terrible pain to Jesus because the jerk he receives shakes his wounded limbs. But when they let the cross drop into its hole 
and before being made fast with stones and earth, it sways in all directions continuously, shifting the poor body, hanging from three nails. The suffering must be atrocious. All the weight of the body moves forward and downwards, and the holes become wider, particularly the one on the left hand, and the hole in the feet also widens out while the blood drips more copiously. And if the blood from the feet trickles along the toes, onto the ground, and along the wood of the cross, that of the hands runs along the forearms, as the wrists are higher up than the armpits, because of the position, and it trickles down the sides from the armpits towards the waist. When the cross sways before being fastened, the crown moves because the head falls back, knocking against the wood and drives a thick knot of thorns at the end of the prickly crown into the nape of the neck. Then it lies again on the forehead, scratching it mercilessly. At long last, the crown is made fast and there is only the torture of being suspended 